I'll start with the end of the story, at least the first chapter of that story, and that's uh, a, a, what I believe is a historic event that happened on January 21st this year in Jerusalem. And um, I was told to pick it up. Uh, we had for the first time in one place, the same time, all elements that are required in order to make electric vehicles the, the dominant form of transportation for, for a country. Um, we had the President and the Prime Minister of Israel standing up and declaring that Israel will get off oil for all transportation needs within a decade. And set a policy, very simple policy, which we'll talk about, to actually make that happen. We had the, the CEO of two large car companies, actually the only CEO in the world that runs two companies in two continents um, in the world, Carlos Ghosn, the CEO of Renault Nissan, stand up and say, we can make these cars, we can mass produce them, we can make them as cheap as cars today, they will be good and convenient, and people will like those cars. And then we'll mass produce them by 2011, as many as you can buy, we will make. We also had NEC Nissan stand up and say, we have the batteries to make this reality. It's not science fiction, we have the batteries, and we have a factory that can actually make it. We had us, Project Better Place, stand up and say, we can build the infrastructure network required for these cars, and we will do it before the cars show up. See, there's something fascinating about networks and infrastructure. If you build them after people buy the product, people just don't buy the products. See, if I told you that you're, we have a new cell phone that has no waves and is not cancerous and all the other phones kill you, but we need 100,000 people to buy the phones before, before we put the first cell tower, you'll say, I want to sign up, sign me up as 100,001. It's the same thing we've done with electric vehicles. The, f the last element we had, which makes this different than a framework or a document or a book, is we had investors who put in $200 million to fund this product, to fund this company on day one. This is the largest seed round of any venture in history. And the $200 million allow us to take what is required in this story and put it in the ground before the cards show up. Now, put all together, policy, car, company, uh, car, country, network, and money. And you can take a country off oil faster than a decade. And I'll, what I'll try and describe to you today is, what is this policy, what is this framework, how does it happen, how does it move on from where we are from the, this January 21st, 2008 event. Start with policy, because we're in D.C. This is actually the, I, I just, I met the Prime Minister in Israel last week, he says it's the first time they're getting calls almost every day from countries around the world asking for a law that was passed in Israel that other countries want to copy. It never happened before. And, and, uh, and they're translating the law to English and they're putting it on their website because people just say, we want the same thing. It's fairly simple. Israel used to have 85% tax on cars. Why? When you ask Israelis, they tell you it's pretty straightforward. We don't like oil. We know what it does to us, what it does to our kids, what it does to the environment, but the, the geopolitical price we pay for oil is pretty obvious to us every day. So what they did is they took the tax on cars down from 85% into two brackets. 72% if your car goes on oil, 10% if it doesn't. And then they said something revolutionary. They said, we will keep that differentiated tax policy for the next 10 years, till 2019. Why 10 years? Because we don't believe that 10 years from now anybody would even want to buy a gasoline-based car. But in the next 10 years, that will be the delta, 60% or more. Now what we'll do is, as more people buy electric cars, we will raise both taxes up. So we'll play with the dial so that we make our money as a government. See, we don't want to give you money. We want to make our money, but we'll move it up as we see demand coming in. If you're an early adopter, you buy the cars first, good for you. You're going to actually sell them for more than you bought them. So there's an incentive for you to move first. If you didn't move first, well, tough. But you still pay less than 72%, so there's a great incentive for you. And you'll see us moving it up, and at some point, there'll be 70% and 
Why? Because nobody will buy a gasoline-based car, and we will make our 70% tax as a country. It's fairly straightforward. That's the policy. Everything else around it, the other 20 pages, is noise. Because all you need to know is that. Create a delta and keep it visible, committed, in the budget for the next 10 years. Now, for the car companies, we also made it simple. We separated between the ownership of the car and the ownership of the battery. See, car companies don't know how to assess the life of the battery. And so they go through these very complicated programs of testing them for a long period of time. And we told the car company, you know what? Just like you don't sell a car with a card that says, here is oil for the life of the car, you don't sell cars with batteries for the life of the car because battery is crude oil. Batteries have the potential of driving your car, just like crude oil has the potential of driving your car. The refining process, going from crude oil to gasoline, is when you put electrons into that battery and you mix really hard, then it has the ability to drive your car instead of the potential to drive your car. And the battery just doesn't burn, it grinds. And it has a life cycle that takes it about 2,000 grinds before it dies. Now, when it dies, it doesn't really die. It still lives for another 2,000 cycles, only at a bit less range. So it's got another cycle, another cycle, another cycle. We went to the car makers and said, could you build me a car at the same cost of a regular car without a battery? And they said, that's actually simple. We have half as many parts, and there's no mechanical grind. And it's all electronics. We know how to scale electronics. So how many do you want? And we said, pretty much as many as you can make. And you'll see in a minute why. I said, sure. What kind of car do you want? We said, good one. <laughs> we don't want a small car. We don't want an urban car. We want a car where people who commute long distances every day can enjoy. We want it with all the safety features. We want five seats. We want it to be fast. They said, how fast? We said, yep. Yeah. Really fast. We built a prototype. It does 0 to 60 in about 7 and a half seconds. It passes every car on the road. And the reason we said it is we realized fairly quickly on we have to respond to the social contract that we have with our cars. We have an invisible social contract with our car. It's implicit. If we don't answer that social contract, it's not a car. It's a souped up golf cart. It's something else. It's a, it, and the contract, you will recognize it fairly quickly. One, it's my car, darn it, I don't share. Right? Every time I share my car, I bang my knee. Some of you know why. Right? Second thing is, I need five seats. 95% of the time, I drive on my own, but I need five seats. Why? We always think that one day we'll stop at a car, at some, some sort of a stop at, at the corner, and four college buddies will jump into the car, we'll go on a road trip. But it doesn't happen, but we want the option of keeping that. We want a fast car. It's number three. Why fast? Most of the time we drive slow. We want the notion that we can go from 30 miles to 50 miles in a blink of an eye so that we can pass the guy in front of us in the Hummer. Rule three. Rule four is we want an affordable car. Now, affordability has three parts to it. Affordable to buy, affordable to operate and own, and I can afford to be seen in that car. <laughs> now, you know what it, 16, when we were 16 years old, we wouldn't be seen in our father's Oldsmobile, right? Today, we wouldn't be seen in a Hummer. And the afford to be seen has really changed over time. It's always the best thing you have for the environment and the next thing after that. When we had no hybrids, it was okay to be seen in a car and an SUV. When we have hybrids, it's okay to be seen in a hybrid and a car, but not an SUV. When you have an electric vehicle, zero emission, it'll be okay to be seen in an electric vehicle, zero emission, and a hybrid, but not in a car. Now, I talk to kids, fifth graders, and we share with them the entire story, and they go back home and they tell their parents, when do we get rid of the evil cars? <laughs> That's what we're going to get as an ocean. You will not be willing to see yourself coming in a car that has a tailpipe. So that's the last part of affordability. But the first two part is we want to make sure that we, the cost of buying the car less the cost of the residual value of the car, which is the cost of acquisition as we see it, because we usually take financing on the car, remains less than what we do today. And the cost of operation, we compare to gasoline. 
So we need to be able to buy a car for cheaper than we buy today and to operate it at gasoline price or less as the bar. We're not willing to pay more to be good. At least most of us don't. The last part of the contract, part five, is a very interesting one, and that's where we differed, looking at it from a social angle versus a technical angle. The techies tell you that until you have a battery that can charge up 300 miles in three minutes or less, people will not switch. Why? Because that's what we do with gasoline. We plug up something into our car and we move energy at 300, min at 300 miles per three minutes. And we actually think the contract is a bit different. The contract is, I'm not willing to stop more than 50 times a year for less than five minutes for more than five minutes. So if I go more than 50 times a year, or more than five minutes, it's not convenient to me anymore. But if you guarantee me less than 50 times a year, the once a week type fill up model, and you guarantee me less than five minutes, I'm good. Guarantee it in a contract, I buy tomorrow. So here's the distilling of the problem. How do we do an electric car when the battery can only go about 100 miles, 130 miles on a charge, it takes a long time to charge. There's no magic. You can't charge really fast. Those who tell you that we can charge an electric car in three minutes, that's a two megawatt line. I don't know if you've ever held a two megawatt line, but there's a sticker on the wheel on that car that says, step away from the car as far as possible. Take your kids with you. Stand behind the wall. If your hair is standing when you come back to the car, it's just static. Don't worry. That's not something you want to drive in. So we need something that can charge up fast and go that long distance. Now, what we proposed, and this works really well in Israel, and you understand very quickly why it works everywhere in the world, is that we put an electric outlet wherever you park your car. Now, for Israel, with two million cars, there are about three and a half, four million parking spots across the country. They're in four major places. You'll recognize them very quickly. It's home, it's work, it's downtown, and it's retail. You cover these four, you cover 90% of the parking spots in the country. Now, it sounds crazy, but countries like Sweden and half of Canada already have an electric outlet everywhere you park your car. Why? Because it's cold. If you don't heat up your engine block when you come back, the car just doesn't go. Fairly simple. Now, what does it mean to put a network across an entire country? For Israel, we said infinity, or the sense of infinity for the consumer, would be about every sixth parking spot. It's about half a million spots. People go, oh, that's really, really expensive. That's about 50 to 100 million dollars. You need that to start. The second thing we said is we have to resolve for the long drive. Now in Israel, we have special conditions because you don't have a lot of long drives. It's a transportation island. We didn't recognize it when you look at the map. But if your car is going outside Israel, it's been stolen. So <laughs> it's, it's fairly contained, which is why Israel is so nicely fit. And most of the drives are within that range of the sub-100 mile. But you can go two, 300 miles if you want to. How do you resolve for that? And what we said is, since you don't own the battery, you only own the car, what you do is you go into a station, it's a swap station, and the battery comes out and the full battery comes in, you keep on going. It's not your battery. What do you care? What's a swap station? People go, wow, this is really complicated. Well, have you ever been to a car wash? Car wash has lots of moving arms. If we really wanted to scare you, we'd call them robots. And those moving arms move in every possible direction. They got water and shampoo and wax and all that kind of stuff coming in. The car's battery swap station has only one arm. It goes only up and down. It comes underneath your car. When you're sitting in that car wash, instead of water, an empty battery comes out and a full battery comes in. You keep on going. How fast? Well, it depends which team designs it. Well, when we go to the car companies and they say, oh, this is very complicated, we always call on the Formula One team for that car company. And they go, seven seconds? <laughs> we can do seven seconds. Anything you want on the car, seven seconds, we'll do it. It's much faster because you're not dealing in ele electrons moving in and out. You're dealing in mechanics moving in and out. Now, how often do you drive more than 100 miles nonstop? Think of yourselves. 
less than 20 times is the answer for more people than not. So if only when you drive the 100 mile plus nonstop drive do you go through a swap station, you're actually getting a better contract. You're going to stop less than 50 times and you're going to stop for less than five minutes. Every time other than that, you'll be coming to your car and be topped off magically. What does that mean? You drive to work for an hour, an hour later your car will be topped off. Now you don't work, go to work for an hour drive for less than an hour at work. Same for dinner, same for movies, same for everything else. You don't go home for less than an hour if it takes you an hour to go home. Why? Because otherwise you'd move where you work and where you live. Part of the social contract. This is a social framework, not a technology framework. When you put it all together, Israel is a $200 million problem. Now to put it in context, that's the first 8,000 cars. $200 million. We have a battle between our infrastructure team and our marketing team. Who's got bigger budget? Here's another part of the infrastructure that's very interesting. The electrons. Where do you get the electricity? Everybody's asking that question. If all of Israel was converted, by the way, the same applies to the U.S. If all the U.S. would convert from gasoline to electrons, we would need 6% more electricity on the grid. 6%. That's half a percent per year for the next 10 years, which is the time it takes to swap an entire country. If we told you that Israel, if I came on stage here and said Israel committed to add half a percent of clean electricity to its grid every year for the next 10 years, my grandoff wouldn't describe me as a visionary. It would be a ho-hum discussion. What's the cost of doing that? The cost of the infrastructure for the entire country plus the clean generation of electrons for the entire country for the next 50 years, because once you put a solar thermal plant or a windmill or any clean generation source, it goes forever pretty much. But the cost of energy for cars and infrastructure for cars, for clean cars, for the entire country, for the next 50 years, is equivalent to the cost of importing crude oil and refining it for one year. One year. Let's reapply that math to the U.S. economy. At today's price, $550 billion a year, just on importing crude oil into the U.S. Half of it goes to transportation, add to that refining, and you're looking at a $300 billion bill just for our cars every year. That's before we take into consideration the oil we find in our own ground. The U.S. economy cannot afford to stay at that kind of price. It has to build a virtual oil field. See, what we've done is we're putting clean generation of electrons, converting power from the sun into electrons. We transmit it on the grid. We put it in batteries, and we drive with those cars. And if you add the entire picture with good software in the middle, you get a virtual oil field. If Israel has a virtual oil field, it has a distinctive economic, geopolitical, and strategic advantage. Press a button on that grid, and those cars feed back into the electric grid the electrons they have in case of emergency. It's a distributed, uninterrupted power supply for the entire country. This whole thing happens in Israel. I got one minute, so the whole thing happens in Israel. We start this year in 08 with tests, with cars. Next year there'll be hundreds of cars already going for fleets, tested on the road. 2010 we have production cars that are coming from Renault, Nissan. 2011 supply meets demand. There is another interesting element which is the entire business model. I won't even get into it, but think of it like a mobile company. Only instead of talking on this mobile, you're driving this mobile. And if you commit for a long enough period of time, for Israel that is six years, at the price of gasoline today, you get a free car, a free electric vehicle. And when you get free electric vehicles, you don't need to worry about demand. You only need to worry about supply. Hence, we can buy as many cars as they can make. This entire framework is now being repeated, and we've been in discussions with 30 countries around the world to do exactly the same thing. Policy, car maker, new company, network, and put it all in the ground. 
In the last six weeks, we've been in 30 countries around the world. My mileage, I, I have so many sins to pay on my climate bill right now that we hope that this works really fast. We think it applies to every country. We think it applies to the U.S. actually faster than most people believe. Main reason is, in the U.S., most people have two cars. You can get one car, the one you use the most, to be a clean car, and you keep the other car for the time you want to drive on that road trip with your five buddies who just stepped into the car on that corner of the street. Keep that on the gasoline car until you figure out that every 50 miles you drove, there was a switch station. And you kind of feel stupid you took the gasoline car. We think it's possible. We think it's fairly quick. And if my predictions are right, by 2020, there will be less gasoline-based cars sold than electric vehicles. And at that point, we got rid of our addiction to oil. Thank you very much.